Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Benedict Lecca reporting from the Harrison Room, your friendly librarian director of the Redwood Library. I want to welcome everyone uh, this evening. Uh, this is for a very special event. Um, Dr. Marquardt, you know him well. This is his fifth year of giving these talks. Uh, and he has given concerts, talks. He, he does all sorts of stuff for us. And uh, we're thrilled to have him again this evening. Um, I want to just tell you a little bit about him real quick. Uh, he currently holds the title of music director of the Chamber Orchestra of Barrington at St. John's. He is also the conductor laureate, Rhode Island Civic Chorale and Orchestra, and professor emeritus of music at Rhode Island College. So we are dealing with a very distinguished person uh, with uh, very long experience in his domain, which is uh, classical music. And as I've said before, of course, um, we have a very expansive view of what the humanities are. Uh, we aren't just gray haired guys like me pawing leathery books, but we're also um, interested in the visual arts and uh, hardly least music as well. So uh, you might remember also earlier about a month ago, we had Clemens Teufel, whom you probably already know since he also has performed for us before, uh, doing early romanticism. And so this evening, I like to think of it as a sort of bookend uh, Dr. Markward will be discussing late romanticism, Bruckner and Mahler, and this is part two. So you might have seen part one, this is part two. So uh, welcome, thank you. Thank you to Dr. Markward, and I will uh, come back when he has uh, finished with his presentation. So thank you very much, everyone, and uh, welcome to this uh, performance tonight. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, it's always a pleasure to be at least virtually in the Harrison Room at the Redwood, where I frequently do these little talks. Uh, we're picking up where we left off last time in June, uh, part two of Anton Bruckner and Gustav Mahler. There were two questions asked at the end of my last session, and I'd like to expand a little bit on my rather terse answers from the last time. The first question was, did Mahler like Bruckner's music? And that was asked by my good friend Al Meyer. Uh, I referred to Bruno Walter, the great conductor at that time, who said, and I repeat it here, quote, I often heard him call Bruckner his forerunner, asserting that his own creations followed the trail blazed by his senior master. You may recall that Gustav Mahler, as a student, studied at the Vienna Conservatory with Anton Bruckner. I think the proof is also in the music, at least some of which we heard last week. Both Bruckner's fourth symphony, as a matter of fact, many of his symphonies start off quietly, as does Mahler's first, and they both were modeled after Beethoven's ninth. I can't count how many times I've referred to Beethoven, no matter whom we are talking about in, the, in these lectures. So much of what happened in romantic music and indeed in 20th century music can be traced back to the trailblazing efforts of Ludwig van Beethoven. So yes, I believe that Gustav Mahler did indeed like Rupter's music and imitated it, at least in his very early symphonies. Why didn't Mahler write an opera, which was asked by uh, the closest person to me in life, my wife, Diana McVeigh, wonderful soprano. Mahler said at one point, the symphony is the world, it must contain everything. Having said that, I think, and many others believe that these are Mahler's operas and that indeed in several of his symphonies he used full chorus, uh, full choruses and solo singers, much as an opera did, and in, at least in a couple of them there is sort of a pseudo-plot, so we have the dramatic effect as well. 
Um, I don't think that Mahler believed he had to write an opera since his symphonies were so all-inclusive. As a matter of fact, to use a phrase from Wagner, these symphonies were Mahler's Gesamtkunstwerk, uh, that is, the all-encompassing art works. I also think that since Mahler made his living full-time as a conductor, and mostly at the Vienna State Opera, that he knew that in order to write an opera, he was then going to have to stage the darn thing. And as we all know who have been involved, that takes a great toll on one's psyche, one's time, one's health, and everything else. So that is my own uh, opinion as to why, partially why Mahler did not write any operas. Uh, suffice it to say his symphonies were his operas, his all-inclusive artworks. What happens now is that after both of these gentlemen's fourth symphonies, beginning with the fifth of each, their music took a decided turn in several directions. Certainly they became longer. They also became more intricate and filled with polyphony, that is many voices moving together simultaneously and in sometimes opposite directions, opposite rhythms, but in any case, much more complex. It might be well for us to look at Mahler right now in, in this light. Um, as a conductor, he premiered all of his works. And up until the last two works, the Ninth and Tenth Symphonies, he had the luxury of rehearsing them and taking things out of these symphonies that didn't work. So the last two symphonies are indeed his most complex, and he did not have the, uh, the occasion to fix them, as it were, as he went much like a Broadway tryout off of Broadway. Um, they both felt that they put their souls unrestrained into the music. Now, this is very, very much a romantic notion. Certainly, we can go back again to Beethoven and find that this might be true. In the Eroica, perhaps in the fifth, in the Pastoral number no. six, and certainly in the ninth symphony, but these are taken to the nth with both Bruckner and Mahler. Another thing that happens is that they both uh, used the church chorale, and we know that Bruckner would, of course, being a, um, a very religious person, in their symphonies, and it came as naturally to them as using the Lundler, or the forerunner of the waltz. And in the case of both of them, we have the utmost solemnity living side by side with joviality, and in Bruckner's case that would be in, in the scherzi or the scherzos, and in Mahler's case the use of the klezmer kind of band that he heard in his native Bohemia. Um, let us move to Bruckner's Seventh Symphony. It is his most popular and most frequently performed. Excuse me. Each of Bruckner's nine symphonies represent in his mind a, an attempt to pick up where Beethoven left off in his ninth. Derek Cook, the great musicologist who actually orchestrated Mahler's seventh or Mahler's tenth symphony suggests that listening to a Bruckner symphony is like walking around in a cathedral, taking in every aspect of it. Uh, I would add that when one goes into a cathedral as a worshiper, there is a goal in mind, and that is to hear the service. But also, one can take in the architecture, the iconic, the icons the actual paintings and so on, the frescoes that are in it as well. And as I mentioned uh, last time, it's very much upon us to go to a Bruckner symphony, especially a long one, with the right frame of mind. It would almost behoove us to be in a yoga frame of mind to listen to a Bruckner symphony. This is the seventh, the first movement of the seventh, Allegro Moderato. Notice again, as I mentioned earlier, that it starts out rather softly, and then Bruckner layers on music much as he would have at the organ. Here we go. A 
do that again. It helps to have the speaker on. Next, I want to play you a bit of the scherzo uh, to show, again, um, Bruckner's ability to write something that's a little faster and not maybe perhaps fits into the cathedral aspect of his music quite so much, but it is indeed a delight to listen to this. He doesn't seem to be able to make up his mind what key he is in. Remember that Bruckner was a big fan of Wagner and Wagner's chromaticism, which Wagner introduced to us all mid-19th century. So many keys. Also, there is relationship here between the theme of the scherzo and the first movement. seven or Tchaikovsky four, that rhythm is a real bear to keep going through a whole movement. It just wears one out. But if it's done correctly, it's a very, very exciting rhythm and we can all dance to it. The finale is marked Bewegt doch nicht schnell, moving yet not too fast. It's a catchy little tune and in Bruckner's manner, of course, he develops it almost incessantly. And then there is a hymn tune 
and a coda. Remember, I said that they were not uh, opposed to using chorales. So this is sort of a made-up chorale by Bruckner. <laughs> then the chorale repeats. I, I think as we talked last week, one can easily, via the orchestration that is this group of instruments plays, then another group of instruments plays, and then it becomes layered one group on top of the other, much the way it works on the manuals on the organ, as we mentioned last week. And also, when he starts to layer these things one on top of another, you can almost see the organist in him pulling the pistons and adding the instrumentation. Overall, for Bruckner, uh, his faith in God gave him the faith that what he did as a composer was correct. In spite of all the criticisms that he received, and sometimes he did work to improve his symphonies, but basically he plowed from one to the next, and at the end, uh, no matter what his critics thought, he left all the original symphony orchestrations to the Vienna Conservatory Library. So he must have had a great deal of faith that what he was doing was spot on. We move now to uh, Gustav Mahler and the last symphonies uh, that he wrote. It's interesting, as I mentioned, that both he, uh, Bruckner and Mahler changed directions after their fourth symphonies. In Mahler's case, the first four are known as the Wunderhorn symphonies. If you recall from last time, there was a, a, a set of folk songs collected by the name of Des Knaben Wunderhorn, the youth's magic horn. And Mahler set many of those texts as songs, 12 of them as a matter of fact, and then he did use several in his symphonies. The fifth through the seventh, or what are referred to as his middle period. As we know, all composers have an early period, a middle period, and a late period. The eighth is a standalone symphony. It's known as the Symphony of the Thousand. It requires humongous forces to, to put on. It's always an event. And here again, Mahler uses voices and a hymn tune, the Vene Creator from the Gregorian chant. The ninth, the tenth, and 
the Das Lied von der Erde comprise the last words. Das Lied von der Erde is an interesting story which we don't have time for right now, but it came immediately on the heels of the Eighth Symphony. Mahler was superstitious about writing a Ninth Symphony because he knew that Beethoven stopped after nine and Bruckner indeed didn't finish his, his ninth and passed away. So Mahler was very, very superstitious. And so he did this work for tenor and alto solo and orchestra, and he called it Das Lied von der Erde, the Song of the Earth, and then he indeed wrote a bona fide Ninth Symphony. What we see in Mahler's later works is increasing complexity and modernistic trends and increasing thoughts of death. These modernistic trends influence greatly Arnold Schoenberg and Berg and Webern, and when we listen to a couple of the scherzos, we're going to find out that there's a tremendous amount of bite in some of them, and that influenced the great Russian composer Dmitry Shostakovich. Uh, and there is a certain amount of burlesque and joke in these, but also a hidden anger sometimes and a satire to be dealt with as well. We're going to listen to a bit of the Fifth Symphony. Uh, of, of Gustav Mahler. And this is in C-sharp minor, minor. The first movement is entitled Trauermarsch, or Funeral or Death March. And it's probably conceivable that Mahler in his youth heard bands marching past his home in Bohemia and would play these kinds of tunes. Uh, you will note in this particular movement that there, the instruments uh, uh, imitate the, ru the ruffle of a drum, including the opening statement by the trumpet. And I must say that the solo trumpet is on every audition list of symphonies, every place. So here is the opening of Mahler Symphony Number no. 5 in C sharp minor. <laughs> convincing. Um, the next movement I'm going to play for you is the second movement. By the way, this symphony has five movements, another innovation uh, of Mahler, but patterned again after Beethoven's earlier work. This movement is a scherzo. It's called, it's, um, the, the expressive marking is Stürmisch bewegt, 
or stormily moving. And I think you'll find that this is one of the, the uh, pieces in, that leans toward a more modern sounding uh, way of going than perhaps even the earlier works we've heard. This is the second movement of the symphony number no. five in C sharp minor. modern in sound, I, I think, for this time. Mahler was writing this symphony in 1901 and 1902. Uh, the, th the next movement is actually the fourth movement, and I think some of you may recognize it. It's sometimes used as a standalone piece in concerts. It's, it's the Adagetto from the fourth, from the uh, fifth symphony. And some of you may remember um, a movie, Death in Venice, by Lucchino Visconti, starring Dirk Beauregard, and I think it was in 1973 or 4. Um, also, when we listen to this opening movement, or this movement, you will hear two pitches, and we can't tell yet for the first few bars. It's on the harp and strings, and the movement is only for harp and strings. And we hear these two pitches and we don't know f for the moment until several bars in what the key might be. This is among Mahler's most tender uh, utterings, but it is not without drama, as you shall see a couple of movements in, or a couple of measures in, I'm sorry. Thank you. 
probably guess I didn't want to stop that particular movement. Um, when, when I do these talks from physically from the Redwood, I usually have a handout as to who's performing what. And I forgot to do that last week, but I shan't forget right now. The first work we heard, the Seventh Symphony by Bruckner, was recorded by Herbert von Karajan and the Berlin Philharmonic. This, the Fifth Symphony of Mahler, is recorded by Daniel Derenboim and the Chicago Symphony. We now move to these last three major symphonies of Mahler, and they are major, major, major works of art. There's no, no two ways about that. Um, the ninth is considered Mahler's farewell to life. When he wrote Das Lied von der Erde, which came immediately before, it was set to basically Chinese poems translated into the German, and Alma Mahler suggested that Mahler's melancholic music matched the melancholia of the poems. The Ninth Symphony is his farewell to life, the Tenth is his farewell to Alma, and he did not have the chance to hear either of those performed. Certainly he didn't conduct them. The ninth was not premiered until 1912, and the tenth was finally orchestrated by a gentleman by the name of Derek Cook, and it's in that orchestration that we'll hear part of that if we have time this evening. What Mahler was going through during these last years of his life, when he died at age 50, Das Lied von der Erde and Symphony 9 were written in 1908 and 1909, and the tenth was begun in 1910. And as I said, he'd never finished it. The first movement was fairly well orchestrated, and then he left for the last four movements, what we know as short scores, uh, four, five, six staves in a piano form that could be played on the piano. The characteristic themes of all of these last three gigantic works are love and death, human life and spiritual life, humor, despair, savage defiance and final resignation. In his prime of 10 years, Mahler only composed in the summer. Remember that he was a full-time conductor and that was his, the job that put bread on the tables. Uh, the Sleep von der Erde, Symphonies 9 and 10 focus more on death and afterlife. And even though 9 and 10 do not have words, uh, we can see from his sketches and things that he wrote into the score, uh, in his handwriting, what it was about. In these last three years of his life, there was the death of his oldest daughter, Maria, from diphtheria. She had been infected with tuberculosis, as had his youngest daughter. She died at age four, the Maria died at age four. 
Alma decided to have a doctor come check on the household, and it was discovered at that time that Mala had a fatal heart condition. At the same time, Alma was battling alcoholism, and Alma was a young, younger than Gustav Mahler, and she was a composer who put her compositional career on hold when she married Gustav. While she was in rehab, she had an affair with Walter Gropius, and Mahler was aware of that and indeed felt guilt. So this guilt about that, finding out about the affair uh, and having a fatal heart condition, having the loss of his daughter all within a short period of time uh, was uh, quite a bit to bear and it, it comes to the fore in his music, I think. Whereas I mentioned Bruckner put his head down and plowed ahead symphony to symphony, Mahler always felt that he was starting over at the very beginning as a student in composition with every work he began. Um, there was this paranoia about him and not, not totally without cause. Uh, he, in 1907, was forced to resign from the Vienna Staatsoper. There were many reasons. First of all, around 1903, he began to take conducting jaunts or sabbatical leaves. The Viennese press, which was not always kind to him, began to pick on him for that. As well, it was openly anti-Semitic. And as you may remember that Mahler was born Jewish and converted to Catholicism to take the position with the Vienna Staatsoper. So all of this led to his resignation from the uh, Vienna Opera. He was offered a position beginning in January of 1908 with the New York Metropolitan Opera and he indeed took that position. He moved to the New York Philharmonic about a year later. The reason being that this young, short Italian conductor by the name of Arturo Toscanini was hired by the Met and Mahler's workload decreased uh, summarily. The musical background for this, uh, we've seen it coming as Mahler has led up to what is going to happen in these in these big big works leonard bernstein said nine is the farewell to life and ten the farewell to alma also there's an ambiguity about keys about becoming more modern uh, ricardo shai the great uh, italian conductor has pointed out that in the opening of the 10th symphony, Mahler uses 11 tones before repeating in any significant way, which is one shy of 12. Uh, and of course, Schoenberg then began sometime later with the 12 tone or serial music, dodecaphonic music, however you care to call it. But Mahler was ahead of his time doing this. However, he can fit it in to a romantic sort of path which he had been following for his whole life. I remember that when Aaron Copland wrote Inscape, which is a 12-tone work as well, Leonard Bernstein told him after the first rehearsal that it still sounded like Leonard, or it still sounded like Aaron Copland. I think this is true here. Whether there are 11 tones or however many, the, um, the piece still sounds like Gustav Mahler. As we move into this symphony, it's in it's in um, four movements. The first is Andante Comodo, or an accommodating moderate sort of tempo. Tempo. The bulk of the composition occurred during the summer of 1909, and as I said, he did not live to see it performed. One thing I almost forgot to tell you, when you listen to the beginning of this, think of Mahler's heart condition, because the opening does indeed imitate the irregular beating of his own heart.
Similarity, I think, in this descending figure in this movement, a similarity to Bach's sigh or cry motif. I want to play a little bit of it again so you can hear that, that weeping after we hear this opening heartbeat. That descending two tones, always that sighing. It's a very, to my mind, a very heartbreaking opening to a symphony. Uh, it's in four movements, but it begins and ends with slow movements. And when we get to the tenth, we'll find out that there are five movements: a slow movement, a scherzo, a slow movement, a scherzo, and again ending with an adagio or slow movement. His second movement to this great symphony is almost like a waltz. It's in tempo eines gemächlichen Ländler, or in the tempo of a comfortable Ländler. And we know what a Ländler is. It's the forerunner of a waltz. This particular Ländler has a little bit of bite to it, I think. It starts friendly enough. Is a little bit Shostakovich like. The next movement, a rondo, a burlesque, allegro assai, or as fast as possible, is even more like Dmitri Shostakovich.
this symphony number nine with an adagio langsam always two ways of saying slow and then it becomes sehr langsam toward the end it's a tortured hymn and i think you can hear the first couple of two first couple of tones of abide with me whether Mahler knew that or not is open to speculation Again, he can't make up his mind about what key we are in. It's a very tortured beginning. And the sound of this torture is achieved by playing the strings, even in the upper register, on the lowest instrument. So it almost sounds like human crying out. So it begins with the strings, and then the horn comes in with this chorale. And then I'm going to skip to the end, which becomes very, very thin as instruments drop out one by one, leaving only the violas and the violins, ending on a really incomplete D-flat major chord. The key of the symphony itself is in D major, so it ends a half tone lower. And it ends with the third, the second note of the triad, not the root of the chord. So even though we think it's resignation, acceptance of the afterlife by Mahler, there's that question mark of an incomplete chord at the end. I'll just cut to that. I don't want to talk through this too much.
see by changing keys how he keeps this intense, intense, intense music moving forward. It's just incredible. And here is the end. The last few bars. can one say after that um, we won't go on to the tenth but I do want to share one thing about it with you as I mentioned it was Mahler, the tenth became Mahler's farewell to Alma and the proof is on the last page of the last sketch for the last movement in which he says, and I'm going to show it to you, für dich leben, für dich sterben, for you to live, for you to die, and then at the very end, and you'll see it on the lower right-hand corner, if I do this correctly, Amshi, which was his nickname for Alma. They're circled in red, and pardon my shaky hands, but there they are the last notes that Mahler wrote. It's very, very moving music. Uh, that performance was by the Philharmonia Orchestra in London under the uh, expert direction of Esapekka Salonen, who for 19 years was the music director of the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And beginning this fall, whenever we are able to begin again, 
he will become the music director of the San Francisco Symphony as well. Uh, that's all I have. So if you have any questions, please bring them forward. I'd be happy to try to answer them. Hi, everyone. Benedict Klecka again, reporting from the Harrison Room at the Redwood Library. Uh, if anyone has any questions at all, as you know, there is a, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dr. Marquardt for a, an enlightening talk, as always. Um, there is a ask a question function at the bottom of your screen. So if anyone has any questions uh, for Dr. Mark Warp, go ahead and type them in and I can read them out, uh, the questions and have him answer. Thus far, none. Benedict, I can't hear you. It may be me. Can you hear me now? You're welcome. Okay. I want to thank Dr. Mark Ward again for a wonderful presentation. We look forward to seeing him, I believe in August on the 5th where he will be talking Late Romanticism, Part 3. Uh, and he will be discussing the music of Liszt and Strauss, the tone poem and other form. Okay? So thank you very much. And uh, just for everyone else's uh, information, uh, July 18, 2020 at 10.30 a.m., the Redwood Book Club continues. Uh, and also on July 22nd, 2020 at 6 p.m., I will be uh, introducing Mr. Rosenbush, who will be talking about his book, Winning Your Audience. So I want to thank everyone, and especially Dr. Marquardt, for a wonderful presentation once again. Thank you all so much. Thank you.